Kara Diamond on late diagnosis and next steps. Le diagnostic tardif et les étapes lorsque vous soupçonnez un diagnostic. Kara Diamond, PhD, is a late diagnosed autistic and ADHD advocate. Growing up, Kara began thinking about differentiation and the potential in every student while working on homework with her younger brother, Danny, who was autistic. She realized the extent of her own neurodivergencies as an adult, often from relating to her students and other neurodivergent adults. Today, Kara is a student-centered educator who teaches autistic children in the Toronto Catholic District School Board, the author of The Autism Lens, and an instructor at the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. Kara also co-hosts a podcast called Autistic Tidbits and Tangents with Maya Tudal, an autistic psychologist from Denmark. Kara Diamond, PhD, une défenseur autiste et TDAH, qui a été diagnostiquée tardivement en grandissant, Kara a commencé à penser à la différenciation et au potentiel de chaque élève, tout en travaillant au devoir avec son frère cadet Danny, qui est sur le spectre de l'autisme. Elle a réalisé l'étendue de ses propres neurodivergences en tant qu'adulte, souvent à partir de ses fréquentations avec ses étudiants et d'autres adultes neurodivergents et neurodivergentes. Aujourd'hui, Cara est une éducatrice axée sur les étudiants et étudiantes qui enseigne aux enfants autistes au Toronto Catholic District School Board, l'auteur de Autism Lens et une instructrice à Ontario Institute for Studies in Education à l'Université de Toronto, Cara coanime également un balado intitulé Autistic Tidbits et Tangents avec Maya Tudal, une psychologue autiste du Danemark. There is a TED Talk called Where Are the Baby Dinosaurs by Jack Horner, and he presents evidence that paleontologists have misclassified many different fossils, assuming them all to be adult types of dinosaurs that are closely related but different, instead of thinking about them as perhaps being adolescent or even child age dinosaurs, young dinosaurs. And it's an amazing talk. You should listen to it. So basically not accounting for the presence of younger dinosaurs. And we have the inverse problem in the autistic community. We know what autism looks like in some children, especially children with externalized presentations. And we're just coming to a place where we're recognizing autism can look very different. A lot of autistic people have internalized autism and it might take longer to spot but they have struggles. Uh, there's no one size fits all, but everyone deserves support. And to bring it back to my dinosaur analogy, I am a baby dinosaur. I am one of those late diagnosed autistic people. And it took me a while to get here and to really begin to start identifying my true authentic self. And I wanna say we are here we exist, whether we have the label or not. Um, I grew up in a family with three siblings. My younger brother, Danny, uh, had more obvious needs and he had a diagnosis from the time we were children. And I grew up with an awareness of his needs. And um, once I read Tony Atwood's book and it talked about sibling responses and I definitely had like the little mother response. Um, but to this day, Danny is one of the people I am most comfortable with. I don't have to mask. I don't have to put in all this extra work. We can exist very peacefully and comfortably and happily together, whether or not we're talking at all. And now I really know why. Um, so I wanted to take a look back. I was a very precocious child. I was hyperlexic. My middle school writing was like Charles Dickens. I had a very grandiloquent vocabulary and it was almost like I thought I was going to be paid by the letter, like he was. Um, I still have words like Google because I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce them. I've done that many times because I first encountered them reading. I was also curious about everything and 
you know, I hated when adults just gave the answer because I said so, that kind of thing. I once horrified a priest because around the time of First Communion, so I was maybe about eight years old, I asked the priest, why did they have to nail Jesus to the cross when they could have just hung him? And in my defense, I, I, I was really curious about this because I had seen Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves over and over again. And it just seemed like a faster, like saving hours of pain kind of end. Um, but my question was, of course, not received with the intent with which it was asked. I um, have always been highly creative. I have a memory that, although it is selective, so I can't always rely on it, I have a memory that in general, if I remember something, I remember it better than most people. I have very vivid memories of much of my childhood. Um, and academically, I think my memory was a blessing. It helped me make up for a lot. Like I compensated for the fact that I was completely disorganized. I never studied. I, I couldn't study. And I had very messy handwriting because I remembered things so well. It was easy for me to draw on my recall. Um, not all the time, but most of the time. Um, and one of the problems with having a great memory is I have very vivid memories of emotional moments too. So I remember every embarrassing mistake I've ever made. And whenever I make a new one, which is fairly common, I would say, it almost triggers like all of the memories one after another replay in my mind. And it's like the shame spiral. Uh, and it, it, it's a, that's, the, that's the downside of a great memory is there some memories you, you vividly remember and you wish you didn't. Um, and I've had some doozies of embarrassing moments. I, uh, a little bit later, so I, I think in grade four, I wrote a short story and it was a wonderful story. I've always been, you know, drawn to writing and I used a whole bunch of conventions. I went between diary, you know, set, uh, you know, 150, well, 200 years ago-ish and the present day. And I played with conventions and it was super creative. The only problem was it was set in the time of the Civil War, and I thought the Underground Railroad was actually a train underground. So that was like where the plot fell apart, but it was a great story otherwise. So I sometimes struggle with literal interpretations if someone doesn't explain that to me. And that, that happens even to this day, and often with like, newspaper headlines so I remember seeing one not long ago about Russian butterfly mines and I was I, I the first thing that came to mind I pictured a mine shaft and butterflies and I was thinking oh maybe this is something like a canary in a coal mine and it took me a moment to realize it was was actually in the context of war and they were talking about a weapon now recess the bane of everyone's existence if you are autistic uh for the most part, I would say, that is not an exaggeration. Um, in my very early years at my first school, I remember sort of trailing behind groups or, or running group to group. I didn't actually stay with anyone for the whole time. And some groups, I wondered why they were trying to get away. Didn't really know, but I really, I put an effort to be friends with everyone. I didn't see a reason not to be friends with everyone, um, but my comfort, depended on the setting. I moved a few years later um, in the middle of grade one, actually. So I guess that year. <laughs> and someone befriended me and called me the wrong name. And I let her call me that name for like three months until she overheard someone else call me the right name. And then it was like, oh, no, now I have to fess up. But I just had so much difficulty finding my voice. And it, it like, Often things that shouldn't feel like a conflict feel like a conflict for me. And I want to avoid upsetting the other person. I want to avoid their distress. I want to avoid my distress. It's just, it's very uncomfortable. Um, I had a good couple of years at the, my second school. Um, I was very, I became very outgoing again. So I went from being outgoing to sort of shutting down and being shy to to restoring my comfort and feeling more confident to the point that I performed the entire Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat for my second grade class. I think it was a day with a supply teacher. They were very happy. I don't know if anyone else was. Um, 
as I grew older, so recess kind of looked like I was good, like one-on-one -on -one with another child. Sometimes we would walk and sing from Beauty and the Beast and or make tiny twig log cabins um, or leap off giant snowbanks pretending to be unicorns. But as things became more political, which happens in the playground very early, grade four, I think was when it started with people saying, you can't talk to that person. Um, I'm not friends with them. You can't be either. And I would always say like, but they haven't done anything wrong to me. I'm friends with both of you. And very quickly that being Switzerland, not taking sides means that you are suddenly the enemy. Um, you are the one who gets disinvited to a birthday party if you're invited at all. Um, and I found in class as well, I was terrified of getting into trouble. So um, if a teacher ever was upset with the entire class or was asking, I know somebody did this. I, you know, I want someone to confess. I always felt like I looked guilty and I probably did because I was stressing out about this. Oh my gosh, will my teacher think I look guilty? Oh, this is the worst thing ever. It was very, uh, the stakes seemed so high. Um, but in the yard, as I alluded to, I was a, a nonconformist that way. Um, I didn't play those games. I'm to this day, I'm not very hierarchical. It 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 takes um it takes a certain kind of of boss, someone in leadership, if I'm uh, working for them, to appreciate that about me because I I sort of expect everyone should be able to bring their ideas to the table and mm -hmm. be heard, especially if it's a good idea. Um, and in the playground, I find it really comes back to get you because suddenly you are the one that is being shunned or gossiped about or both. Um, but even when I was physically included, I always felt like an outsider or like I was just like on the periphery, um, you know, I, or I was allowed to sit there, but they weren't looking at me or talking to me. And that's especially a little bit older, you know, probably grade seven and eight was like that. Um and I remember I, there was a friend and I spent a lot of time with this friend, but I often spent more time with my friend's mom. I was really close with my friend's mom. Um, now by grade six, I switched schools again, I switched schools a lot in elementary school. By grade six, I was bullied. And I remember at recess just wanting to be invisible. I didn't, I didn't really spend time with anyone. I no longer wanted to stand out at all. I didn't want to volunteer in class. I, I was quiet. I became a very, very shy child. Um, it was a year that greatly affected my self-esteem, um, my mental health, as I tried to cope the best that I could alone. But I was also always, I, this is a trait I still have, though I think I'm getting better at it. I am a very solitary problem solver. If something is bothering me immensely, I don't want to burden anyone else with it. I don't, I didn't want my parents to feel bad. I didn't want them to, to worry about me. Um, and part of that is like my hyper empathy to others. Um, I never want to distress anyone. I also have hyper empathy for objects like, like, oh, I should wear that pair of shoes because they're probably lonely. And to this day, I, I thank my GPS, but part of that's because I, you know, I like to imagine if one day AI takes over, I want them to remember that I was one of the good ones. Um, I also have difficulty. So although I'm very attuned to other people's states, I have difficulty recognizing my own emotions. I sometimes have to work backwards. And I, re I remember thinking about this in childhood where I'd, I'd be like, why am I upset? I can tell I'm upset. My, my, you know, my heart is racing. I feel a certain way. Maybe I have tears in my eyes but I don't know what's upsetting me. And I had to go through like the Rolodex of recent experiences to kind of go, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? No, that's it. To pinpoint it. And I do that to this day where I have to work backwards, not for some emotions, but definitely for the ones that are distressing. I have to really think about it. Um, and, and that also makes it hard to problem solve if, if I don't actually know immediately or in real time how I feel, what I want to happen, all of those things. Um, and I also have, this is probably going to sound very hard on myself, but I, I feel like I have a complete lack of assertiveness 
to problem solve in conflicts with others. Um, I can even get to the point where I can no longer speak. Like I just can't even formulate words. Um, so it's sort of like a situational mutism um, during conflicts or burnout. And I remember as things got harder in, in my early years, I would ask to stay home more and more. I would say I felt sick. And I don't think that was completely an exaggeration. I do think anxiety gave me symptoms that when I was at school made me feel unwell. And I just, I took so much comfort if I was allowed to stay home and watching The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe over and over again, um, it was sort of like my comfort routine that I would, I would watch that movie and eat crackers and cheese. Um, and later, and when I was like a preteen, I was more interested in watching Hollywood golden age movies. Um, and I would often copy them. I would repeat phrases from them. I would look at my face in the mirror. I became really interested in theater and acting as I approached high school. Um, now, my lifeline as a child was really my family. They supported all my interests. My, my mom painted all the sets and made costumes for theatrical productions I was in. Um, my father, at, when I was like a preteen, he had me edit his first novel and he had such respect for my thoughts and ideas. And it just that writer to writer relationship remains one of my favorite things. <clears throat> um, my teenage brother, uh, he's, he was older than me. Uh, there was a stage in the year that I was really badly bullied. I wrote some very dark poetry and he actually read some and asked if he could use it with his heavy metal band. And it was amazing what it did for my self-esteem um, to have my, my work and my thoughts appreciated. And writing was something that gave me a place to escape to. I really looked forward to just sitting down and writing um, when I was at home. And again, it helped me develop a self-esteem that has carried me my whole life through difficult times. Um, I switched to an art school in grades seven and eight. And when the friendships didn't come, when I, fa I found it very difficult to kind of break into the, the cliques that were already established, there was, a t like, there was a point where I just made the conscious choice. I said like to myself, they're they don't like you they're not going to like you and that's okay focus on academics get through this year and next year and then you're going to a different high school and you won't see these people again and so I focused on the work and I focused on extracurriculars and I sort of shut down the emotional responses um but I was lonely I was left out um and but I, I sort of got through with cognitive strategies, like you're not here for friendship. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, you know, I, I did my best to cope in ways um, to get through that. Now in high school, it was like I made a conscious choice to be everything I wasn't. Like what I tried to analyze, what was it that people didn't respond to about me? Was it that I was like, you know, when I was younger, it was that I was really eager. I wanted to answer all the questions. I actually didn't understand I was one of those blurters where I would call out because I, I actually didn't understand the teacher didn't not see me. Like I, I just wanted the acknowledgement that I know the answer. And I think if I'd had a teacher say to me, I notice that everyone's hands are up and you know, I notice everyone who raises their hands, but sometimes I pick different people for this reason, but I know that, you know, the answer, I think that would have reassured me quite a bit. Um, but I always wanted teachers to know that I knew the answers when I was younger. And actually, even in high school, I still did, but not in class. I wouldn't participate. Instead, on my exams, especially if it was like true or false or multiple choice, I wouldn't just circle what I thought. I would actually write the reason why I picked that answer because I wanted them to know the full extent of my thinking. And I didn't feel like that was captured by true or false or multiple choice. And I always had a fear that they were designing a test to trick me. Um, so uh, in high school, I changed how I dressed uh, initially. I, I sort of changed my attitude. I became, I, I tried to project that I didn't care about schoolwork. I became a bit more sarcastic um, and unfiltered in the things that I said. I didn't want to be as keen. Um, and everything I thought that maybe 
wasn't likable or was some trait that people had disdain or or disgust for, I tried to hide away. Um, I and I was also more acutely aware of my face, of my tone, of all these things, because I'd been told that I looked snobby or standoffish. Um, and that was never my intention, but I think when you feel like an outsider, sometimes you don't know how to how to react. And so there's like, there's so much freeze that you can look like, uh, you can look those ways, I guess. I guess it can be misinterpreted. Um, and when I got home in high school, I would take re naps every day. My mom would say like, what, what is wrong with you that you are taking so many naps? But it was just, I was completely drained. Um, so for me, what prompted the diagnosis was, well, it was a combination of things that, that the end result was burnout, but on a ton of uncertainty, injustice in the world that I'm like, I'm a very sensitive to injustice and a lack of accommodations. Just, I, I didn't know what to do anymore. I felt like I was losing skills. I felt like I could no longer rely on my memory. I felt like I couldn't organize myself. Uh, everything that I had carefully controlled for so long in my environment was now difficult for me to control. Um, and I was, I was having difficulty coping my, you know, I was very concerned about my mental health. Um, and I started to think about that. Um, a friend even asked me whether or not I might be autistic and so had a long-term partner uh, previously. And like, I'm going to be honest, like I usually am. <laughs> um, I had been doing quizzes for years and I'd been like doing quizzes repeatedly because as an autistic person, I want to be completely accurate. And it's so hard to be accurate on Likert scales because they'll have questions that are like, um, you know, rating how comfortable are, are you comfortable socializing with others? And it's like always, mostly, sometimes, you know, never or some sort of scale like that. And Every, every question needs context. Am I comfortable socializing with my brother, Danny? Absolutely. Am I comfortable socializing in a group of teenage girls? Not at all. Like, am I, you know, so I never knew how to answer those questions, but like, it didn't even matter when I made slight changes going through and answering the questions, pretty much always showed up as autistic. Um, but it was kind of just in the back of my mind. Um, I, I never thought I was going, going to pursue a diagnosis because at the time my thinking was, um, and again, I had, I had been very carefully controlling my environment. I was doing really well. Um, I was successful in my job, um, though I, I do attribute much of that success to the fact that for over a decade, I have worked with a wonderful child and youth worker, and she has coached me through many difficult situations. She has helped me prepare for parent-teacher interviews. She takes notes during, like all the things that I have trouble with, she is like my surrogate executive functioning. And, uh, and just being able to talk through like, oh my goodness, I'm not exactly sure how to handle this situation. What do you think? Um, I, like she, she has been there for everything and that has been a, a, an incredible accommodation in itself. Um, so, so many of the things that were hard for me, I avoided doing or I had really good workarounds. So it is possible. It is possible to, um, you know, thrive with the right supports. Um, and you don't necessarily need a label for that. Labels are inaccessible to a lot of people, which is a really a shame because I think having a diagnosis has really been a blessing for me. Um, I, I also had students who asked me, um, you know, how do you understand us so well if you aren't autistic? And, you know, I, like I should have thought about that a bit more at the time. But one of the things was it took me years to recognize my sensory needs again, because I avoided situations that I found difficult. I, uh, I remember my best friend when she got um, well, she was engaged to be married at her bachelorette. One of it was at a, one part of it was at a nightclub. And this was the time I like, if I wasn't in a different city, sharing a hotel room with everyone, I probably would have 
said bye at this point, but everyone went to the nightclub and it was so loud and overwhelming. I, I just clung to everyone's coats and sat near the washroom with everyone's coats and did not go on the dance floor once. Like I was the biggest Debbie Downer at this. And for years I have beat myself up over it because I thought like I should have just like forced myself. I should have. And I was forcing myself just being there holding the coats. Um, it was so uncomfortable. It was too noisy. There were too many people. There were the, the lights like, and I have just protected myself from so many of those things. I haven't put myself in those situations. I still go into a dark room after work for like at least an hour and just need absolutely no stimulation. Um, although having my pets there to cuddle helps me stay in the present. So I, I don't ruminate about things, but I just need the downtime. I need to not talk to anybody. I need to restore some of the energy expenditure of being in a very social chaotic environment. Um, I also had a friend give me noise canceling headphones to try. And it was, it was like a revelation uh, because when I put them on immediately, my whole nervous system relaxed. Um, I, I couldn't believe the, like the visceral sensation that I had. And I didn't realize how irritable I actually felt on public transit and in other settings where there were so many people. And I was just like tightly wound and anxious to the extreme. And um, I've come to realize just how often my brain is on overdrive because this is the thing. When your brain works differently than other people's, you don't know your brain works differently than other people's unless you start listening to other people's experiences or actually talking about these things. The, the assumption I think every person makes is that my experience is the norm. And I put that in bunny, bunny ears quotations, the norm, because there is no normal. And we do have to normalize the idea that there is no normal. Um, but my brain is on overdrive in every single interaction in every waking moment really and i i'm still learning how to relax it's not it's not one of my skills uh, and you know there's other things that i could tell you but i also don't think as autistic people that we have to share you know our most personal traumas to convince you that you know i have been masking and i've struggled with things and that i continue to mask and also struggle with things um like I said, diagnosis has been a blessing. And if it's something you are considering or preparing for, I hope it's also a blessing for you. Um, I also want to say like self-diagnosis is completely valid, especially because diagnoses are inaccessible or really costly. Uh, and that excludes many of us from being able to access it. Now, if you are in the stage where you are getting ready to or you're considering getting a diagnosis. Um, I'm gonna share some of the things that I did. So I, I've i kept a running list on my phone for years with just like odd things, quirky things, things that I've wondered about whether that was different about me compared to other people. Um, but I, I actively started doing this after some questions from my friends and family members. And uh, I also got on Twitter and I started following actually autistic people, the autistic community, the ADHD community. And every time someone wrote something that resonated with me, I would, I would write it down. I would take note of like, oh, that's really similar to how I've experienced this. And another important part was asking loved ones, what, what did they notice about you? Especially things that um, areas where you might be rigid uh, you don't always know that that's something that <laughs> that other people aren't rigid about, you know. Um, now, if you go to my website, I've actually prepared a um, a template that you can use when preparing because I actually developed <laughs> a 21 page, 7000 word saga uh, where basically I I charted different neurodivergent traits that I had over time. So what did this look like in childhood? What does it look like now? Um, 
And this was really important for me preparing to go into my appointments. They, they are hours long. I had several appointments that were hours long. And I was really nervous about forgetting things that would be helpful. So this was a framework. It was a structure. It helped me to go in with a clear idea of, of things I wanted to share or ask about. Um, so I would really recommend doing that, um, taking those notes, sorting those notes, using that template if it's helpful to you or developing your own. Um, I also, I found a clinic where all of the diagnosticians were also neurodivergent. And for me, that was an important point um, to be comfortable talking with them um, because I can't, I can't put things on Likert scales. As I mentioned already, precision is really important. I really needed a conversational approach so that I could unpack experiences, have them ask me more details if needed. Um, that to me it, it was a meaningful experience and they really spent the time. I think it was like, I'm gonna say seven to nine hours in total over three sessions uh, about that. Maybe that's just what it felt like, but it, it, was, it was quite a lot of time. Um, and another thing I would say is, be prepared for big emotions as you talk, because a lot of the things that come up are things that you haven't told people, or at least in my case, um, being a solitary problem solver, like I brought up a lot of experiences that I kind of kept away in like a little box of shame that I didn't want to talk about with anyone, um, but had always thought like th there's something wrong with me because of this experience or because I reacted this way or because um, this was how I felt and other people didn't feel that way. I will also tell you in the aftermath, it helps you to reframe your life. It helps you to reframe those experiences so that you can be kinder to yourself. You can forgive yourself for some of the things you've held on to as like this, this sign of, of shame or unworthiness, because that is not the case. Um, and I hope for you, uh, it helps you to Consider all the ways you have unfairly held yourself to neurotypical standards. You know, we live in the society where we're, we, we're made to feel like our value is tied to productivity and likability and our interactions. And, and both of those things can be hard at times for neurodivergent folks, you know. Um, and so I, I really came to understand, and I'm still coming to understand, like all of this, I'm a work in progress as we all are as human beings, but that it is okay to need help. It is okay to tell people these things are really hard for me because I have hidden the, that so that a lot of people see one aspect of my life like me at work and they think that, um, you know, they're gonna come over to my house and I'm Martha Stewart. And that is like the furthest thing. This is like the one wall that is not cluttered. <laughs> so you see it in all of my videos. Um, I now have given myself permission that if there's an, a social event and I max out, I, I either leave or I give myself a break. Like I will go and sit in my car for 20 minutes and not make apologies or explanations even. Um, and I don't feel guilty. I'm, I'm not beating myself up for that. I am trying, so I haven't perfected this yet, but my, my current goal for myself is that when I take that downtime after work where I am in the dark and just decompressing and not talking, that I'm, I'm I'm using it intentionally and I'm not just in my head going, there's a million things I should be doing. Why am I not doing these things and beating myself up? Because you know what? That isn't relaxing. And it is really nice. One of the things that has really opened up for me, one of the things that has freed me, it is really nice that when I am with friends um, or family who I'm very comfortable with, of course, is I don't have to worry about what is my face doing? Um, how is my eye contact? I can actually like look off into space and speak. And actually, for some reason, that that helps my brain stay more on topic. I will never say fully on topic because I have a very fast paced brain. It's very tangential. I have rapid fire thoughts that is very hard to keep up with. <laughs> um, but when I'm able to not look at someone, when I can look away, I can slow it down a little bit better than when I'm also taking in the input of what are they doing? What are they thinking? What am, is my face doing? What are, <laughs> it, so that is one of the nicest things around safe people to be able to drop that completely. Um, another piece of advice I would have for you is if you can, if you can afford it, um, 
try to find a therapist who is neurodivergent themselves or neurodivergent friendly. Uh, many will have a sliding scale. So if that's helpful, hopefully um, that will work out for you because it's really great to be able to talk through things with someone who understands where they come from, who doesn't judge or, or add to feelings of shame um, for doing things a different way uh, and needing to do things in a different way. Now, I haven't figured it all out entirely. And every day there's like something new to process about myself from my memories, how my brain works um, or ways in my life that I have coped, whether it was for better or worse and how I still do those things in a lot of ways. So I am now learning to live more authentically. Um, I, of course, have significant privilege as a white, cis, like neurotypical passing, quirky neurotypical passing, I suppose. And for me, of course, that comes with some level of, um, when I unmask, it is not inherently dangerous in the situations that I've been able to unmask. And I truly hope that the world that we live in, that that becomes true for everyone at some point. Um, so if I could go back and tell young me anything, and by extension, these, these are, are things that I would like to say to you. You are valued. You are not too much or not enough. You are exactly enough. You're allowed to relax. You're allowed to relax. <laughs> I really have to internalize that one still. No one is good at everything. Stop holding yourself to insurmountable standards. You are allowed to need help. And there's strength in being able to ask for help. And the beautiful thing about being interdependent with others is you can ask for help and still have the ability to help other people. You can still offer things to others. Although again, our value is not tied to how much we offer to others. Um, another lesson I'm still working on learning. Now, autistic joy is the flip side of having your emotions dialed up to 11. So savor these moments, seek out the, the hobbies, activities, sensations, places, music, foods, all of the things that bring you joy. You know, even if you're going back to childhood, if you love toys, if you love uh, train sets, so like whatever it is that you love, you can do those things. Don't stop doing it because you think people don't think it's like adult enough or mature enough, or if it brings you joy, you should do it. <laughs> uh, so long as it's not harmful to anybody else, of course. Um, don't feel embarrassed about the things that you're passionate about. You will find your people. You are deserving of whatever support you need, as is everyone. And unlike in Jurassic World, dominion, we can create a world where everyone peacefully coexists and has what they need to thrive. And if I've learned anything from the original Jurassic Park, it's that we are stronger together. So whether you are a correctly labeled fossil or you are a long lost baby dinosaur, you're welcome here. Connect with Kara. Communique avec Kara. www.karadiamond.com.